This is lesson 13 for May the 28th, 2017. It is from our Faith Pathway Bible Study Manual for Adults. Uh, this is concluding our lessons from Unit 3, God's Pervasive and Sustaining Love. And our lesson's topic is Seeing the Big Picture. Our devotional reading is Psalms number 86, verses 8 through 13. Our background scripture is Jonah chapter 4, and our printed passage is Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. Our key verse is, Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. Our lesson's aims are, share three things that hinder love and care shown toward persons of a different culture. Evaluate your priorities as to whether you include any concern for the lost of our nations. Determine one action you will take to witness the good news of Christ to an unsaved person. As we come to the end of the book of Jonah, the fourth chapter, we have a glimpse into how Jonah responded to the work of God and the will of God being fulfilled. We see that in the preceding chapters how Jonah tried to flee from the charge, the task that God had placed upon him uh, because of his prejudice towards the people of Nineveh, his hatred towards the people of Nineveh, and then we we also reflect upon how uh, in his uh, attempt to undo what God had already ordained and planned would be done, um, in his attempt of his fleeing, the disturbance, the trouble, the confusion that he caused for those around him, and then even though it appeared that uh, he was plunged to his death, how God even preserved that act which would have sent someone else to their death, but God had a plan, and even the act that appeared as though it was for uh, Jonah's demise, it actually turned out to be for the salvation of Jonah, for the fish spit Jonah up on dry land. And then, just as Jonah had uh, foresaid that he knew that God was gracious and he knew that the message of God would cause the people of Nineveh to repent, which uh, got under Jonah's skin because he had such great hatred and he has so much dislike for the people of Nineveh that he did not want to see them saved. He knew that once the word went forth that it would do as the Lord has told us that when he speaks that his word does not go forth and then return to him void, but it accomplishes the will for which God sent it out. Well, Jonah knew this, but... Um, not just Jonah, 
But the lesson causes us to think about ourselves and to reflect upon ourselves, especially since we are in a time um, in this sphere of time where we're seeing uh, what some may have thought uh, attitudes and prejudices among people of different backgrounds. We're seeing an emergence of a lack of tolerance, uh, a dismay in terms of how people feel about other humans. And we're seeing a rise of racism and prejudice. Uh, so as we think about Jonah as an individual, as one person, we also should think of this attitude as being collective, that this attitude and this, this view of other people, that it's actually being coerced, it's being orchestrated. And uh, when we reflect on how Jonah responded, then let's also think of ourselves and of others that we know who have the same sentiment that Jonah displayed. So verse one says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong and he became angry, very angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord? When I was still at home, that it was this is what I tried to force stall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, that you're slow to anger and you're abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. For it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? After what God had done for Jonah, for Jonah being disobedient and not following the will of God, was it right for Jonah to be angry after his own his own life had been preserved and saved. Why are some of us so entangled in hatred and dislike and envy and anger and such towards others that it is so great that it blinds us and it, it keeps us from seeing how God is still blessing us in spite of what other people may or may not be doing and according to what our limited uh, view in judgment of what others should receive because of their behavior. But in spite of all of that, if we could just focus on uh, what God has done for us, what has God done for me? What has God done for you uh, in the process of trying to redeem us in spite of what some other individual or other group of people may or may not be doing? Did that at all hinder God from rescuing us? Then if God saw fit to rescue us from what we know that we were guilty of, then why do we become so angry when we see God show forth that same love and kindness and compassion and redeeming power for others? Because we become captivated by the power of prejudice and the coercement of it that programs us to thinking that it's okay to wish the demise on other people. It is the programming 
that causes us to do that. There's a very uh, insightful book. Uh, it's entitled Dehumanizing the Vulnerable. It's the war of words against, vix, uh, against victims. It's by William Brennan. A very insightful book that just re, re, it, it just causes us to look and reflect back on how the media now during the biblical times we would say how the scribes and how those who had influence over people how they would allow their platform to uh, convince the people who were persuaded by them to convince them that it was okay to dislike this group of people that it was okay uh, not to feel any concern if something of bad will happens to this group or to that group. And in the book, The Dehumanizing the Vulnerable, it just talks about how the media and how broadcasting and TV and newspapers and such have been used throughout history uh, by one class of people or one group of people to strike and to take advantage of another group. It's been used to dehumanize women. It's been used to dehumanize the Native Americans. In fact, they were not referred to as Native Americans, but savages. It's been used to uh, cause the encampment of Jews in Germany. Hitler used the media and broadcasting to program people to make them feel that it's okay to exercise hate and contempt and even death on people because these people are inferior. These people are not like us. These people are savages. Uh, these are just uh, women of ill repute. These are just people who are marginalized. Uh, they're never going to amount to anything. Uh, so when we think about Jonah and his attitude towards the Ninevites, do we also share some of those attitudes about present day Ninevites? Is there a group of people that we feel it's okay to expel or to, um, for some cause of bad will to fall upon them? Would we feel any remorse uh, from certain people being struck uh, if they give us the right title the right name to describe this group would it uh, would it affect our consciousness to a degree where we could see it on the news and then say well you know they're savages anyway well you know they're terrorists anyway well you know they're illegals anyway. So let us look at again what Jonah and how God revealed his attitude to him to cause him to see his own faults because God was already aware of who Jonah was. He knew that Jonah was going to try and run from him before he gave Jonah the assignment. He knew about Jonah's character. He knew about Jonah's attitude. But he said, you are still going to fulfill my will. So let's look at what uh, he says uh, in verse 5. He says, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter and he sat in the shade and he waited to see what would happen to the city. Isn't it something how we establish our little places of comfort and then we just sit back to watch calamity take place. 
We just sit back and watch to see misfortune fall upon people. Uh, we don't find ourselves involved in trying to uh, assist and try to uh, offset whatever those uh, issues may be. Sometimes, unfortunately, we find ourselves captivated by the joy of seeing the misfortune of others. But it says, then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, after God had allowed him to get comfortable in this setting where he was trying to remove himself so he could watch and see the demise of the Ninevites. After this, then the Lord provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And then when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And here's where he said he wanted to die because it would be better for him to die than to live. And sometimes uh, when we have allowed ourselves to be so entrenched in the things that are not suitable uh, for human good, they're not suitable for our health, they're not suitable for our condition it's not suitable for us uh to go forth and and be productive and be positive and be what god intended for us to be so once we recognize that now we are beyond our own power then sometimes rather than submit to change we almost are willing to just cancel out well, I would just rather die. It'd be better for me to die because I can't see myself changing my attitude. I ain't going to, uh, I'm just not going to do it. It'd be better for me to just go on and cash in. Now, now let's, let's listen to what God says in uh, verse 9 through 11. For he says to him, but God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Is it? And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. Here, God proposes a scenario to Jonah to allow him to see the attitude of himself. So he questions him about his concern about a plant but he's not concerned about real people. He's not even concerned about the animal stock of the people. But he finds somewhere within himself that he can execute or he can exercise some concern about a plant. And maybe it's because this plant was providing some comfort for Jonah while he was resting and watching to see what he hoped would be the demise of the Ninevites. Sometimes we can show concern for certain forms of comfort that are provided that make our ill, uh, our Ill attitude that makes, makes it okay for us to reside in that state of mind or behavior that we're in. And when that form of comfort is removed, now all of a sudden we're aggravated and we can show some concern. 
about that element of comfort more so than the concern that we should be showing for the people who really need it. This was a plant, but he had more concern about, about a leafy plant than he did about real people to whom he himself was one. So um, it, it uh, keeps us mindful of the fact we're in Second uh, Peter as the uh, commentary list for us that in Second Peter, the third chapter, where it says, and that God is long suffering and not willing that any should perish, but that everyone would come to repentance. So God, who made the plant, who provided the comfort temporarily for Jonah, also made the people. And just like Jonah was concerned about the plant, God is concerned about all of God's creation. Now, I want to lift one uh, uh, other passage of scripture, because not only has Jonah, uh, along with others, displayed this behavior and this attitude where there is just uh, so much uh, just disgust with others in the process of trying to help and assist. But I wanted to bring our attention to uh, Luke, the 13th chapter and the uh, fifth verse. And it talks about the woman with the issue of blood for 18 years. And it, it brings our mind to the fact of another again people's attitude and how they would try and use uh other little tidbits and details to try to override what the real issue is and exposes what their real sentiment is this is luke the 13th chapter and the story begins at the 10th verse, uh, at the 10th verse. And it begins to talk about how Christ was teaching in the synagogues on the Sabbath. And then the woman who had the spirit of infirmity for 18 years, uh, who couldn't stand upright, was bent over because of her pain. Uh, she approached Christ. And when she did, he called to her and said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And when he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Well, then the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath and said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. And the Lord gave this response. He said, hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it for 18 years, be loose from this bond on the Sabbath? So he, he brings focus to the fact that, again, people get so caught up into themselves and, and who we are and and our position and uh, this person is not equal to me and follow the guidelines. Isn't this something how we always try to tell other people to follow the guidelines, but the people that need to follow it, they can't follow the guidelines. <laughs> they can't follow the guidelines or they can't be obedient to the will of God, but they're quick to tell others, be obedient to the word of God. It's six days that you're supposed to come, not on the Sabbath. 
but but then they can find themselves working in the will of the Lord. There's another passage as well, and this one is in the uh, 14th chapter of Luke. Uh, and this one begins on the fifth verse of the 14th chapter of Luke. And again, the Lord is healing on the Sabbath. And he proposes a question to the Pharisees that, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And as he raised the question, they kept silent. But he went ahead and healed the man with the dropsy. And then he answered and said, which of you having a donkey or an ox that had fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath. Because the people in positions of interpreting law and held with the responsibility of not just proclaiming the word of God, but also being living examples of it. So he again identifies and declares among the listening people that look at where their priorities are. They are more concerned about animals than they are about the suffering of people. So as we look at our lesson today, we should uh, ask ourselves, are we too more concerned about things that are not significant? Are we more concerned about our position and our place and our status? And have we become so entrenched and so like just overwhelmed with these materialistic and these uh, these modes or means of some type of classism that we lose sight of what God really intended for the blessings that he has afforded to us for what the purpose of those blessings are that we would bless others. So as we look into our lesson and and identify the individual person of Jonah and his attitude as it has been displayed, let us also ask ourselves, is there some Jonah in us? Is God trying to get our attention? Is God planting uh, greenery and plants around us providing us temporary shade to get us to see our own uh, wrongdoings? Are we more concerned about animals or plants and any other tangible things? Are we losing sight of what the real goal of God is? And that is to save souls, that is to redeem the loss. So as it has always been our prayer, and that is, is that we hope and pray something that has been said, that we have lifted something from the lesson that allows us to have a farther insight into God's purpose and God's word. And we always pray the blessings of Almighty God to be upon you today, now, and forever. God bless you.